Hello and welcome to Enchantment of Eternity's review for The Matrix. Uh, this video is it was a Patreon uh, requested video requested by a patron uh, Quack Addict. So thank you so much Quack Addict for your support and all those who support me on Patreon. Uh, very much appreciated. So anyway, Quack Addict uh, requested a review of this 20 year old movie because it is in fact the 20th anniversary of The Matrix, and it is going to be uh, re-released in, uh, in theaters, in select theaters around the U.S., and Quack Addict tells me that she's going to go see it. I unfortunately am not, because it's not playing really near to me. It's like maybe a half hour, 40 minute drive, and uh, I like The Matrix, but I don't think it, no, I'm not enough to drive 30 minutes to see a movie if I've already seen them. A lot of times in the theater although it would have been nice to see it in that theater but only if it was a bit closer anyway I did watch it again though from the comfort of my home and I'm here to give some of my thoughts uh, on the matrix and also matrix news that is uh, making the rounds which you probably heard they have just announced they are going to make another matrix film uh, which will star Keanu Reeves and uh, Carrie Ann Moss will return. Uh, and But I haven't heard any word about Lawrence Fishburne uh, returning, which, spoiler alert for the third movie, Keanu Reeves and Carrie Ann Moss's characters die <laughs> at the end of the third movie, yet Lawrence Fishburne's character survives. So uh, we get a confirmation that the dead characters are returning, but the alive characters are not. So find that a bit weird i don't know like i have no there's no context on what this fourth movie will be it will be a sequel continuing on the third movie will it be maybe like some sort of prequel that takes place in between the trilogies will it be a reboot uh that just happens to feature the same actors but it would completely like some people throughout the a speculation that they're going to erase the events of part two and three and do it again because a lot of people didn't like it I don't know. None of that. Nobody knows what's going on. But anyway, this video isn't to talk about that. This video is to talk about the singular movie, the first movie, The Matrix. So, just to start with some personal background information on my personal relationship with this movie and where I was at 20 old years ago, uh... It's, so it came out, I believe, the summer of 1999. Uh, this came out, like, I believe two or three months before I went to New Zealand for the first time. Those familiar with my channel know that I lived in New Zealand for 15 years. I moved there in 2004. But I also, I visited there for the very first time in August of 1999. So pretty much 20 years ago. <laughs> uh, I was there for six months. Uh... And that was my first time in New Zealand. That was really my first time leaving America, unless you count going to Niagara Falls when I was three years old, which I don't. Uh, <laughs> and so, yeah, I don't know. I, I just bring that up because I was, even though I hadn't been to New Zealand yet, I was dating a New Zealander, which is eventually why I did get to New Zealand. And so, for the, I remember seeing this movie, and for the first time, I was very impressed that I was able to spot a foreign actor was faking an American accent. Because there's a lot of other times, particularly uh, 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 Liam Nielsen, uh, who was in uh, Darkman, uh, I've heard a lot of critics saying, oh, it's so obvious that he's faking an American accent. But I totally couldn't tell. And, uh, um, uh, I don't know if it was because I was dating in New Zealand there at the time, but I kind of spotted that, uh, I, I don't know if I picked up exactly that he was Australian, but with Hugo Weaving, I definitely spotted, I think the possibility, he could have been British for all I know, because all I knew is that he was definitely faking an American accent, because, uh, the person I used to date at the time would sometimes mock American accents, and so it kind of sounded like that, which to me doesn't sound anything like an actual American accent, um, and Hugo Weaving, I mean, he didn't do a terrible job. He wasn't like, uh, <laughs> uh, 
um, God, what the Benedict uh, Cumberbatch is in Doctor Strange. He did quite a <laughs> quite a bad job with the American accent. And by the way, nowadays I can spot. I wouldn't say all the time. Sometimes some British actors fool me. Like sometimes, like uh, the guy from Battlestar Galactica and a few other people are like, they're English. Like blows my mind so not all the time sometimes they get away with it but i do spot out a hell of a lot more like uh that dude um i'm not sure what part of the uk he's from but the dude in the leftovers who played matt the priest like i spot like right away that 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 he that was he was putting on an american accent uh so i do spot it a lot more <laughs> um, than I used to but this is the first time and I, I was very proud of myself for spotting like the first time I saw this movie it's like that guy is not American and I went home and went on the internet I believe the internet was around I don't know if he even had the internet in 1999 if I did I know it was around but I don't know if I personally had it but, <laughs> but somehow I found out that I was indeed correct but anyway um the other important thing to note about this time period for those who maybe not be as old. God, I feel so, this makes me feel so old that this is 20 years ago. But um, that around this time period, there were a lot of movies. I actually uh, bunched this movie together with a lot of other movies that came out around this time. Most of them in 98 were... Uh, and in fact, you could even go as far as to put the Sixth Sense in this category, although I personally wouldn't. But there was a bunch of movies came out around this time that was all about pulling the wool over your eyes. Not, and I'm not just talking about having a twist. I mean having presenting an entire world, the universe, the setting of the film is set in, and then you find out, or at least the characters find out, that the whole world they live in is not what they thought. Which is different than just a twist. It's like the whole universe or the whole setting is not what the characters believe. Uh, and the other movies that always come to mind is Dark City, uh, The Truman Show, and The 13th Floor. Now, with The Truman Show, the audience knew what the setting of the world was. They knew because of the trailers and everything told you, and I, I believe even the movie itself tells you immediately that this is a TV show. Uh, but it's the character who doesn't believe, who believes the world is so totally different than it is, so that's why I would still bunch it in the same category as The Matrix and the other films, even though the audience knew the characters still don't, which I think is the important part. Now, uh, the 13th Floor, you may not have heard of that movie, and I wouldn't blame you because it's actually not any good. <laughs> I remember I did like it at the time it came out just because I liked that, uh, the whole, I was into that whole trend of, uh, the whole world, the setting isn't what you believe it to be, but, um, it's not very good. I watched it, uh, like, ten years later, and I was like, I, it felt like a B, or like a straight-to-TV B movie. It did not age well at all. I'm like, ugh, I can't believe I ever liked this film. So, it was horrible. Uh, <laughs> but it was also, you know, it was also about a simulation, which, spoiler alert, uh, a guy who was visiting a simulation of the, like, 60s or some earlier time period, but it turned out, spoiler alert, that the guy himself was in a simulation of the 90s that a future version uh, was set, like, sometime in the future was running a simulation of a simulation. I don't know, it was a bit silly. Anyway, uh, I wouldn't recommend watching that, maybe. Anyway, Dark City, on the other hand, I'm actually going to have to say I like it better than The Matrix. Now, as I'll get into, I do really like The Matrix, especially re-watching it just now. I did appreciate it a hell of a lot more. Um, but, I don't know, I personally like Dark City better. That's Dark City has always been one of my favorite films of all time. When I did a top 50 movies, I put Dark City, in, I think it was in my 20s, and a lot of people were expecting, because I slowly, dis like, I didn't just do one video for my top 50s. I did a several, a series, so over a year. So some people were guessing what would be my top 10. Several people guessed 
The Matrix, but The Matrix actually didn't make my top 50. I think on IMDb I wrote out a top 100 and then made my top 100, but it didn't make my top 50. Um, so I do really like the film, but I wouldn't say it was one of the best films ever, personally. Uh, so I did prefer Dark City, but I do acknowledge that Dark City is a bit more niche. Uh, and um, The Matrix is a lot more... Uh, receptive to a general audience uh, than Dark City is. Um, yeah, a lot, I can see Dark City, you have to have a certain kind of taste. I can see a lot of people being turned off by it. And, to be perfectly frank, um, The Matrix has better production value, better acting uh, than Dark City does. But I just have a sore, you know, a soft spot for Dark City. I actually just love the story more. And I do like how it's executed and the visual effects. Um, so to me, The Matrix was always like a lot of people see it. And, and this is the reason why I bring this up. Because a lot of people see it as this revolutionary, unique film. But to me, it was just another and a whole batch that came out. All in those same two years, 98 and 99. Of these films that all did the same thing of making you believe... Or at least the characters believed, I should say, that the setting they lived in was totally different than the setting that they actually did live in. Um, and as I said, I think Dark City did better, personally. But the thing with The Matrix is that it's it's a lot more philosophical. Like, especially watching this movie just now, almost I could tell so many lines... Uh, this movie is so allegorical that it's, it's just so many lines of the film, the lines of dialogue, you can tell have double meanings. That it's meant to be allegory describing modern day, um, which I'll get into more. And it's, and it's very so philosophical, I'm possibly more than Dark City is. But, I don't know. To me, it is, a, it's a, as I said, it's more receptive to general audiences and that's probably what turns me off to it more because the action can get a bit much <laughs> a bit over the top and in fact i have heard this film criticized have seen it criticized for being too violent and too ridiculous and how you know the main characters the uh, Neo and Trinity are going around killing a bunch of police officers who for, they know or believe they're doing the right thing. So we're supposed to, these are heroes who are killing innocent men with family, just <laughs> mowing them down with machine guns. And some people have, have pointed that out. And in fact, I do believe, because this is roughly around the Columbine incident in 99, I do believe this film got was under attack for uh for all the you know mass shootings and gun violence which of course has become an everyday occurrence since that time not that it wasn't not that it was rare in 99 it was still much more regular than it should be but um and a lot of people try to point at uh you know they blame marilyn manson who actually has a song in this movie in the credits and they blame this movie the matrix and saying oh it's promoting violence which I don't want to get it too much into my stance on the gun issue, uh, only just to throw it out there, I am extremely anti-gun, or I should say extremely gun control, because there's a difference between banning guns and gun control. Gun control is not banning all guns, which is the straw man. Every single fucking NRA argument or anti-gun control argument is all straw men. I've never seen a single argument coming from that side that is not a straw man argument. But anyway, I'm getting off topic. <laughs> Point is, the argument that violent movies or violent video games or Marilyn Manson or anything is a chief cause of these mass shootings is an argument that I think has no basis in reality. It's just a knee-jerk reaction that these programmed movements use to deny the exact excuse uh, to deny that gun control is necessary. Uh, and because, and I remember because this Bowling for Columbine, Michael Moore movie came out a couple years after this, played a clip from The Matrix of like, you know, Neo shoot having that huge rail gun shooting at Agent Smith. And 
play that clip in a different language. I can't remember what language. His point being, all these other countries have these violent and living in New Zealand. Also, Matrix was just as popular over there as it was here in other countries, and yet they don't have the gun violence of the U.S. So obviously, the movies, violent movies, violent video games, are not the chief cause of mass shootings. That's just a, that's just a ridiculous straw man people use to deny the actual issues at hand. But this video is not about gun violence. <laughs> this video is about the Matrix. So. Getting back to the Matrix in particular, so I just the point is I don't have I don't have an issue with the violence in that regard because I think that argument is BS. Um, but it is the violence does interfere with the story for me in some regard just because it's a bit over the top. This is a bit much, and I think that's why it appeals to mass audiences and just my personal. Uh, just my personal taste is probably why I prefer a movie like Dark City, which is less like having that mass appeal. But, just to clarify and just to reiterate, I still do really love this movie. And I do love how it takes that mass appeal, the action movie, and injects this philosophy into the movie. Now, also, I think it's very interesting. Like, it's become so commonplace nowadays. This movie is so classic. You know, like, it spawns so many memes on the internet. Uh, the blue pill, red pill thing. That, oh, what if I told you that Morpheus actually didn't say what if I told you in the movie itself? <laughs> and stuff like that. It's another, like, slightly out of context lines, like, beam me up, Scotty, and Luke, I am your father. Which are, are paraphrasing other lines, but they're not exact. The quote, the direct quote is incorrect. But anyway, because as the what if I told you is paraphrasing, he did say something uh, along those lines, but it wasn't that exactly. But anyway, uh, yeah, this movie has become classic, but and so it's easy to forget for those who weren't alive or weren't or were too young at the time this movie came out that it wasn't so mainstream when it first came out. I mean, don't get me wrong, it made a lot of money. It was a blockbuster, to be sure, but it wasn't a blockbuster along the lines that, say, Star Wars was, or as along the lines as even Transformer was. Uh, it was one of those, you would say, second-tier blockbusters, really. Like, it, was, it made a lot of money, but it wasn't like the highest grossing movie of the f of the year and I didn't look this up but I'm pretty sure it wasn't even in the top five or at least for the first several months it came out I think it did gain more popularity as it went uh, it was one of those movies that stayed in the theaters for a long time because people didn't watch it at first but through word of mouth it started to gain popularity so I remember when I first saw it it was kind of like a second tier movie and one of the reasons why it really works is because of the advertising is because it doesn't tell you what the matrix is now you compare this uh to the sixth sense now this is something i had a teacher at film school used to talk about the sixth sense a lot because the sixth sense is known for having a twist at the very end which i'm like you probably even if you haven't seen that movie you probably know what it is so i'm not going to spoil it for the off case for that one person watching who hasn't seen the sixth sense or doesn't know what the but a lot of people know the sixth sense for that twist ending at the end of the movie and a lot of people forget that there's actually two twists in the sixth sense and the first one comes halfway through the movie and the reason why a lot of people don't think that's a twist is because the trailers and promotional material give it away. And I'm referring to the fact that the kid, uh, the main character kid in that movie, sees dead people. And he has that famous line, I see dead people. And that was in the trailer. And so that's how the film was marketed. The film was marketed to audiences, this kid sees dead people. But if you look at the script itself, and for the studios who read the script, this was a twist that didn't come until halfway through the movie. And I, I, that's 
teacher in particular that I'm referenced would often criticize and said this was a failure of the marketing department by ruining that twist and giving it away where they should have presented it they shouldn't have presented it as a twist but it was they were using it as a way to draw audiences in so they had a clear picture of what the film was good about but it actually ruined uh, and that's why no one thinks of it as a twist when really it is now you compare that to the matrix where the twist of the matrix actually does come in halfway through the movie just as the one in the sixth sense did um but the trail the difference is the trailers didn't give it away and i give so much credit for the production company uh, and the marketing uh, department for not ruining that. Because that would have been a great way uh, to market the film. Uh, to have uh, this futuristic sci-fi. But as far as you knew from the marketing... And I remember the trailers in particular. Because I had, I would had no idea what the Matrix is. And in fact, the whole trailer was was geared on making you wonder what the matrix is in fact it had the line where morpheus was saying i can't you know i can't tell you what the matrix is you have to see it for yourself and so that was they made that into a meta statement for the audience saying we're not going to tell you what the matrix is and in fact i don't even know if they used this term but it was if they didn't it was implied what is the matrix and i think that's such a better marketing tool because when people actually did go see it and they had no idea what the matrix is they were completely blown away with the reveal and that makes the reveal so much more powerful whereas if they went the sixth sense route and told, gave it away in a trailer i think the film probably wouldn't have been a pop has popular wouldn't have as strong as word of mouth it's that twist that it's halfway through the movie it's not the end and it's that twist that really makes this movie powerful. In fact, I've heard the argument postulated by many people that the reasons why the second and third films didn't work as much is because you already know the twist. Uh, and so the reason why the first film was so much more effective is because you didn't know the twist going in. Um, which, I don't know, I did a video that I actually prefer the second film <laughs> to the first one. I haven't, I didn't rewatch the second film, so I don't know if that's still uh, how I think, but I know that's an extremely unpopular opinion. Uh, but I think that has more to do with the story structure. And I actually, mainly the action sequences too. I think the action sequences of the second film were better than the action sequences on the first film. In fact, as I said, that's one of the things that kind of draws the first film back for me. As much as I love that, the shocking reveal of what the matrix actually is, I do think some of the action sequences that happen after you find this out do drag a bit and they weren't that interesting to me whereas the action sequences particularly the highway scene of season two uh season two <laughs> the second movie uh was probably one of the best action sequences in all of cinema in my opinion uh but you know the second movie's biggest flaw is that it ended on a cliffhanger that set up the third movie which totally sucked balls <laughs> so i don't know if i'd still say that the second movie is better than the first it's something i've had to look at again but it's an extremely minority and extremely unpopular opinion to even say the first two are on par but i'm sorry that's how i feel but anyway but the third movie is nowhere near it's just crap but anyway um Getting back more to the philosophical side of this, because another thing I remember about when this movie first came out is going to this this gathering where you know a bunch of hippies camping in the woods, and I remember just uh, swimming in the river, and there was these two old hippies sitting there having a long philosophical discussion and it took me a while to realize they were actually talking about the matrix, and one guy was describing the matrix to another guy who hadn't seen it, and. If you, there's been so many uh, conspiracy theorists love this movie, and I love to cite it. And there's been so many academic articles, and, and so many other like conspiracy theory type articles online saying, "Oh, we're really living in the Matrix," <laughs> and it's become 
very commonplace, and a lot of people use it to uh, to um, promote theories, which I do think is batshit. But <laughs> that being said, I don't necessarily see that as a bad thing because you can, from the tone of the movie, it's very obvious that the there's a lot of very obvious undertones that's very anti-authority. That because the heroes of the film uh, are basically hacker types. It's this film before you know the twist is presented as a modern day hacker type film. That's how it was promoted, and that's how it reads for the first half of the film. Which again, maybe why some people don't like the sequels as much because from the sequels, it's obvious from the get go that it's a futuristic sci fi story. Where here, you actually first believe that it's a modern day hacker esque story until you get the huge reveal and so the allegory is pretty obvious that it is it is really promoting an anti-authority authority or authoritarianism uh message but the authority isn't like some dictatorship or like nazis or or, or the soviets or anything like that the authority is modern american government or modern American authorities because the uh, villains are agents and they look like with the, with the stereotype or the cliche you would think of of FBI agents and all the police any authority figures or whatever are seen as the villains and the and so again a lot of people will, will hold that against this movie and the, of course the heroes of the film are those who are uh, who are subculture um, who are seen as hackers or outlaws or whatever. But I think, you know, the message is a simple, goes further than that. Uh, because it's postulating that the dominant culture of what people believe reality to be is not actually what reality is. And I do think that actually is a strong message. I would, I would actually personally make that a bit more metaphorical than literal because some of these conspiracy theories like I've read this huge long essay about how we're actually living in the matrix they take it a bit too far and to postulate theories which I would personally ascribe as batshit <laughs> tinfoil hat which I'm not for but I do overall agree with the overall lining undertone structure of the film that's uh, perhaps reality isn't what it is generally perceived to be because there is, and this is something I studied. There is society does have a a story, a basic baseline story that is so natural to modern society. People don't even realize that it, that it's a story or an agreed upon, agreed upon. Uh, cultural acceptance they just see it as a norm like natural just like weather or rivers water but it's not natural like that it's man-made but it's so common to modern society that people never question it and i think in reality the is a bit more abstract and has some of these conspiracy theories would uh, claim it to be but it's still there so i still think this is and i definitely think that's what this film is getting at of course, the film does this by making it more literal, that there's a literal, like, matrix, and there's evil computer aliens and the AI in the future that are perpetrating this to enslave the human race. Now, at first, I was a bit off-put by having the AI be the villains, because I actually don't like that cliche. I think that is fear-mongering against technology, and too many films like Terminator or whatnot, Battlestar Galactica or anything, even though I like those things, I, I get sick of that cliche of the evil robots or evil AI. Um, but the more I think about this film, it's acceptable to me because it's mostly an allegory. It's not, this movie is not about how evil technology is or how the you better be careful the AI is going to enslave the human race. 
that's not the main thrust, the main point. It's just an allegory for how misinformation or a misperception of what reality is can be used to metaphorically, not literally, but metaphorically enslave the common person. Like, you could say example of this is how a lot of uh, lower class uh, or poor people support Republicans and people like Donald Trump, which if you actually examine it from uh, an objective standpoint, their policies and what they promote is very damaging to that class, but the, the class is so wrapped up in this perception that, uh, uh, you know, they're actually supporting them because they agree with them on certain religious issues or whatever like that, uh, that they're living in the matrix per se. So that's the kind of analogy I may, would make more or less, rather than saying, oh, the Clinton and the Bushes are a bunch of lizards from outer space or anything like that. <laughs> That's an extreme example of this conspiracy theories. But, um, and so that's why I really enjoy this film. Uh, and that's why I do think it is it's really powerful and how it, it blends that element of the philosophy, which, as I said, uh, I didn't write down any specific examples, but there's almost all the dialogue, a lot of dialogue, a lot of specific lines are very much like meant to have that double meaning that it's it makes sense for the context of the film but it's also like the way that morpheus phrases a lot of things like he does it in such a general term where it's obvious that it's meant to apply to modern times as well that is not because he could have phrased it differently to be more specific to their specific situation but they i could tell that the writers purposely made it a bit more general to be like you know, this misperce misperception of reality, the Matrix, is being used to enslave you. That that's meant to have uh, more allegory to modern times. And I actually do appreciate that writing style a lot. Now, <laughs> I'm going to talk about the red pill, blue pill thing. Because I think a lot of people get that confused. And to be perfectly honest, I myself did. I could, did not know which one the red pill in fact, I think I referenced it once, and I didn't know which one was the pill that, you know, revealed reality as it really was, or the one that lets you go and live your lives as normal. Because of this is another um, example, like a lot of conspiracy theorists and others would use, oh, take the red pill or take the blue pill and see life for what it really is. But if you want to be a sheep, a sheeple, you can take the red pill and go back to the normal life. Yeah, I'm mixing it up on purpose. I know what it is now because I just watched the film, but uh, a lot of people mix it up. <laughs> That's why I was mixing it up. Because I think at one point I did believe the red pill was the one that made you go back to normal life and the blue pill showed you what the matrix actually was because you think of red as bad red stop red means stop so that's why and i think that's why a lot of people get it mixed up and i think i myself got this mixed up so the thing okay if you want to stop this journey has uh, morpheus uh, describes it into the rabbit hole um it seems like red would be stop but actually, watching it again, I didn't make a point of paying attention to this. Red was the pill he took to reveal the Matrix, and blue was the one that made him, that if he just go back to bed and think it was all a dream. Um, which I guess I could see red, because red is, if instead of having the image of stop, but having the image of, like, excitement or danger or this is exciting you know this is taking you into this exciting new land i can kind of see that point of view view where blue is a bit more like sort of mellow and uh, okay if you just want to be a normal person you take the blue pill if you want excitement take the red pill so i can kind of see that aspect but i think personally think the stop thing makes more sense but whatever anyway <laughs> that's a huge tangent but i think that's why people get those two mixed up uh anyway but i do think like the allegory that i really attach to the most is the fact that once you see the matrix you can't go out once you see reality for what it is and that 
the people who are still caught up in the Matrix, they could become, like, the agents could turn into any of them at any time. And Morpheus is basically saying anyone who's not free to the Matrix could potentially be a threat. Now, how that, this could be perceived as if you're not for me, you're against me theory, which is something I'm very much against. But I don't interpret it that way. I see it more along the lines... Of, and I think this is, because I do, not getting too crazy or conspiracy theories, but I do have a lot of subcultural beliefs and, and subcultural understandings. And a lot of, and like, the fact that I don't like the Dark Knight. <laughs> but even, you know, getting more political or sociological rather than just about movies and film, I do, I do have some beliefs that are a bit subculture, even if they're not batshit conspiracy stuff. Um... And but uh, the general culture would, would see would dismiss that, and I think that anything that's seen as subcultural could be seen as living outside the matrix. And so people, it's not that they're evil or they're wrong. It's just this is the general perception of reality that is dominant. So if you present something outside of that dominant perception of reality by the people on mass. Uh, it's going to be dismissed as crazy. Like some people, what I, the statement I said earlier about how uh, Trump supporters are actually working against their own interests, I'm sure there's a lot of people who dismiss that as as just nonsense, batshit crazy, uh, because they're in that particular matrix. And it's hard to see outside once you're out, but once you realize, once you see it, it's you can't go back, and, and it's really obvious to you, and it gives you a whole different perception of the world. So I'm talking more along those lines rather than the lines of once you realize that the Clinton family are lizards or whatever. Because no, <laughs> um, and that's why I think this movie is 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 so powerful. But from a storytelling standpoint, I do think, and this is why I wouldn't say this is one of the best movies of all time, like some people would, because, and why I say I actually prefer uh, movies like Dark City, is because I do think from a storytelling perspective, from a plot structure perspective, as I said, I think it does drag a bit uh, after you get the reveal. But particularly, like, after the scene where uh, Cypher turns on... Uh, the others and kills them off which is an exciting scene but it kind of annoys me how they just kill off all the characters in that one scene it seemed a bit too much like red shirting to me but anyway after that scene <laughs> it kind of drags me i mean i do like the excitement of rescuing morpheus but i think the the action scenes <laughs> where you know trinity and and uh neo have all those guns and they're going around killing all the police officers which again you look at it, they just believe what they believe because they're in the matrix do they really deserve to die because of this but then you can make analogies to well what about uh nazis like soldiers who in the nazi party like they could have been they would just sold this lie of what they believed hitler was selling of were they really bad people but it, they were because they were following anyone who follows hitler was bad regardless of their personal thing you could say the same thing about these pe people in the matrix they were supporting these evil robots even though they weren't aware they were doing it uh and they're not they may not have been bad people uh personally they were actively trying to oppress the human race so <laughs> you could like it look at it from that perspective and again i do like that dynamic of it but the action scenes itself <sighs> I kind of dragged a bit to me, to be honest. And, uh, and but one thing I do like about the major, and it's not just actually. I should said it was after Cyphus, but Cipher betrayed them. But it was actually a bit before. The movie does drag a bit once Neo comes out of the Matrix, and they're ex like, I I like the exposition scenes. Don't get me wrong when they explain what the Matrix is. I think that was very well done. But then you get a lot of scenes like the karate scene between Neo and Morpheus, and and uh, the love story between uh, Trinity and Neo, which. Be perfectly honest, I don't think it worked very well in this film. I think they did a better job of this relationship in the sequels. To be frank, it did seem kind of like, oh, here's a male lead and a female lead, so obviously they're in love. <laughs> it did seem a bit like that to me. Um, 
And the whole thing, the whole storyline with the one is obviously very fantasy tropish, uh, which does seem to have. I don't know. I would say slightly diminishes the the theme, the philosophical themes of having this very fantasy tropus. Oh, he's the one. He has magical powers and he can save us all. <laughs> so, yeah, that that's that seems like an easy out or an easy way to uh, push the plot forward. Uh, a, f a fix, as you would say. But anyway. Um, a, a crutch. No, that's a better term, a crutch. But anyway, um, yeah, so, but I did really like the ending. It was really exciting when, when, uh, Neo actually turned around and killed Agent Smith. Uh, Mr. Anderson. I mean, come on, it should have been obvious to anyone that he was, that was faking an American accent. That sounds so weird. But anyway... Uh, <laughs> um, so that was exciting stuff, but the whole again it felt a bit tropus when the you know Agent Smith killed Neo and he just magically came back to life, and they never actually explained that. I mean, I think it's implied that since Neo was so in touch with the Matrix and had so much mind control over it that he was uh, because when you die in the Matrix, you only die because you think you died. So his mind control was so much that he was able to override that and realize that he wasn't dying, like the whole there is no spoon thing. But um, he was already dead. So <laughs> that, I think, kind of... Eh, I'm a bit iffy on that one. But it was still really exciting. And I still really loved... It was a powerful ending when he flew away and they played Rage Against the Machine, the song that I was already very strongly familiar with. So it was really great to hear that song uh, and ending out the credits. And it became a bit of a tradition uh, playing Rage Against the Machine in the credits. Although the third movie didn't do this, is probably why it sucks. No, it's not. I'm just kidding. It's, there's other reasons why it sucks, but it doesn't help. Anyway... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, I think that's pretty much all I gotta say about the Matrix. Uh, so my rating for the Matrix out of ten uh, is a nine. Uh, excellent. Uh, I not quite a ten for me, uh, but I did really enjoy this film. I do think they do a really great job of telling an allegorical story in a sci-fi setting. And as I said, they did a really great job of marking this by not giving away the twist. And they, they had present interesting characters. But if I look at it from a plot structure perspective, it's not terrible, but I don't think it's the best. And as I said, some of these action scenes did drag a bit, and it kind of lost me. It didn't keep me completely engaged throughout. But that's not to underscore like how powerful and effective uh, the philosophical elements combined with uh, the sci-fi action adventure and modern settings and the whole, of course the whole pulling your wool over the eyes I don't think any movie not even the sixth sense did it as well as this movie did uh, maybe Dark City but it would be on par anyway that is it uh, for my review of The Matrix thank you so much for watching this uh, be sure to check out my channel as I do other reviews on uh, shows like Star Trek, uh, The Expanse, Lost, and more. So be sure to subscribe so you can keep up with all that. And thanks a lot for watching.